you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's webinar, Safari Online with Party Safari. Yay, I'm so excited for this one. Um, my name is Stephanie. I'm the Community Program Coordinator at the Riverwood Conservancy. I want to say a special thanks to Credit Valley Conservation for making this webinar and other programs at Riverwood possible. Before we get to today's presentation, we have a couple housekeeping notes as always. All of our April webinars are up on our website. Every afternoon this week, we are hosting free webinars on a new topic. So tomorrow's spring web webinar is pesky plants, where we'll be learning all about invasive species of plants, what Riverwood is doing about them and what you can do in your own backyards. And if you have the financial means to support our programs and conservation of Riverwood's lands, please consider donating at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash donate. And today we have two people joining us. One of them is Catherine joining from the Riverwood Conservancy. She is the education program manager and leads high school teacher. And we also have Jennifer Weaver from Party Safari. Party Safari was established with the intention of giving kids of all ages the opportunity to learn about some of the world's most fascinating animals in a fun and safe way. All animals, big and small, play an important role in keeping our ecosystem strong and healthy, and it is their goal to spread excitement and love, just a few of our amazing creatures. Party Safari is a family-owned business, and the animals are considered a huge part of the family. They're handled regularly and are carefully screened before being taken out on a safari. If you want to book a party safari for a virtual program, please visit their website. I will be putting all the links in the chat. And the Riverwood Conservancy would like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Nations. The territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this place is still home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Now, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A tab and all other comments can be put in the chat bar. If you're watching from Facebook, I will be reading the comments and questions as well and bring them back to Jennifer. And I will be posting some resources in the chat in just a few moments. And Jennifer, welcome. I will hand it over to you. Thank you so, so much uh, for joining me. Thank you for having me. Thanks for uh, joining me in my animal room. Um, so today I'm gonna to show you a few different animals. Well, maybe some pretty cool ones, some that you might recognize, some that you might not have seen before. They are not indigenous to um, Ontario. These are from around the world. So you're probably not gonna find them outside in the wild. If you do, they're there by mistake. <laughs> um, we're gonna get started with Alice. As you can see, I have her right here. Alice is a green cheek conure. Right now she's a little bit worried about what's going on, but that's okay, she'll be okay in a minute. This is not her normal room. She stays out in the main room with us. Um, she comes from South America. I'm just going to say, boop. Nope, she's not going to. She is trained, she is potty trained. So sometimes we just have to take a break just to see if she has to go. Um, she is, uh, like I said, a green chicane. She comes from South America and they're very, very social animals. So she really needs to be with the rest of the family um, since I don't have other green cheek conures. Um, she, she wants to come and see me. She's a little bit nervous. Um, she loves me the most, but pretty much anybody who has food, she's gonna go and check out, right? If you have food, she'll nod her head and say, yes, please. She can talk a little bit. She can say, treat, treat. Can you say, treat, 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 treat. No, she's not going to. She says, no, the camera's on me. I'm not talking. Um, she can also say, step up. And she usually says that at night when she's just down on the bottom of her cage and she's um, crawling around and she's looking at stuff. She will say, step up, step up. Other than that, she doesn't really say too much. Uh, we're working on quite a few words. Um, like I said, she's a little bit nervous, so she feels most comfortable when she is close to my hair and close to my chin, so she'll snuggle under my hair. She likes to groom my hair a lot, so she'll play with it and she'll groom my ears, and she's, she's very, very social. Um, she likes to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. Um, she, you know, would eat some insects and stuff. 
Um, and they're, and like I said, they're very, very social. So there'd be great big flocks of them, which I find would be super amazing. If we were in South America and you could see like a giant flock of Conyers flying by. Um, they are really, really cool birds. They can live about 15 to 20 years. So it's a big commitment if you decide to get one as a pet. And they're, they're very, um, they need a lot of attention. They're kind of like little toddlers. They need a lot of attention. Um, and if she doesn't get attention, then she screams very loud, but that's okay. Now you see that she, she looks like she's biting me, but she's actually not. What she's doing is she's just putting her beak out to, to grab hold and to balance herself. She is looking a little bit scruffy at the moment. She's molting her feathers. If we look on her back, you can see right down here, there's a pin feather coming in. So she's growing in new feathers. Um, it's the, the molting season. So she'll lose all her feathers, not all at once, a few at a time and grow new ones in. And by the time she's done, she will be so beautiful and her colors will look amazing. Right now she's a little bit itchy and she likes to get head scratches, although right now she's not so sure. Um, yeah, these, oh, you can say step up. He said, step up. No. <laughs> she's not so sure about looking at herself too. She doesn't know if that's another bird. She's not quite sure. Treat, treat. You say treat, treat. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so if there's any questions about her, I'd, I'd be willing to take some. I think we had one. And there's so many comments now in the chat that I'm <laughs> disappeared on me. Oh no. Oh, um, when somebody uh, is named Sawyer, age nine, has asked, what, when she touches you with her beak, what does it feel like, Jennifer? Um, when she just presses it gently, it just feels like um, you're being touched by like the end of a pencil. Sometimes she, she gets a little bit enthusiastic in her love. And she may nibble a little bit more, a little bit harder. But when, when she's just putting her beak like this, it doesn't really hurt me at all. She's just trying to, um, she's communicating with me too. So she's she, right there. She was kind of telling me that she's not really fond of coming away from my shirt. So she was, she was just letting me know, communicating a little bit. But for the most part, she's very, very gentle. And when she grooms me, she just, she just kind of nibbles. And she just, it's just like she's preening my, my feathers. But I don't have any feathers. <laughs> It's the thought that counts, right? <laughs> I am going to tuck her away though because she's getting a little bit nervous and I don't want her to fly. So I'm just going to put her in her cage here and get ready for the next one. And uh, Jennifer, we had a question actually from George and he's asking, um, did you just say that uh, your Conyer is potty trained? Uh, so when she is out of the cage, she is potty trained. And what I say is I say, boop. And she'll, I hold her away and I have a special towel that I hold her above and I say, poop, and then she poops. Wow. I don't have to pay attention. You know, there are accidents. I do have to pay attention and um, watch her body language because she gets a little bit fidgety when she has to go. So then I'll pull her away and, and let her poop on the thing. And then she comes back for more snuggles and stuff. Amazing. Yeah. She has me trained too. <laughs> Not just trained. I am trained as well to pay attention. <laughs> And I guess uh, we'll do one more question about her. Um, are they good pets? Um, so birds are super fun. They're very, very smart, but they are a lot of work. So they, they need a lot of attention. They make a lot of mess and they make noise sometimes when you just really don't want it. So sometimes uh, at night I have another bird and he likes to scream really loud and it kind of sounds like the call from the jungle. So, um, you know, it's it's a lot sometimes. They, they really are, it's, it's kind of like having a little kid in the house for the whole 15 years that they're that they're alive. But they do give you a lot of love and um, affection and they're such good company. And she's she's my sweetheart. She We spend a lot of time together. So uh, a lot of research needs to go into what kind of bird is best. Um, you know, any, any of these animals, if you ever were to consider having one um, as a pet or join your family, you a lot of research needs to go into, into what's required to have them. Um, and she also needs, you know, good fresh foods, which we should be eating too. So that's not a big deal, but you know, it is, it's a lot of research needs to go in. And can we do one more question, Jennifer? Oh, of course. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. And then you can move on. Um, I like questions. Questions are good. Yeah. C has asked on Facebook, what is the lifespan for them out in the wild? So probably not as long as in captivity because they do have to work a whole lot harder uh, to find some food, to stay safe. There's predators out in the wild that want to eat them. Whereas here, she's pretty much protected by, you know, I 
protect her from everything that's going to hurt her. Um, so, you know, you probably, I would say if it, if it, 10 years, that'd be a pretty good lifespan out in the wild. It could be longer if they're really, really good at staying away from getting into, into trouble. Wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. No problem. All right. I think we're going to move on to um, a reptile. So I do have one that is, 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 uh, never been to actually has never been to Riverwood before, but because I'm doing this from my my house and from my animal room, we're gonna see how she does today. She's a big big girl. She's very cool, and we're gonna do with her next just because she is ready to come out and see everybody. So bear with me while I get her. Okay. She's currently wrapped up in a blank. Oh, there she is. This is Agnes. So I have Alice and Agnes. And she is a black and white tegu, an Argentine black and white tegu. So she's really not sure what's going on. She was quite happy in her blanket. I'm going to try and take her out of her blanket in a minute to show you her whole body. But for now, you can look at her amazing tongue. She has a really long forked tongue. And right now she's smelling. She's smelling the air, trying to figure out what's going on. She doesn't know if it's feeding time, whether there's something that's going to um, harm her, whether, you know, she's not quite sure what's going on. Plus, the computer is a little bit different. She's not used to sitting in front of that. So she's going to be smelling that, too. Um, and she is a very big lizard. She is diurnal, which means that she is awake during the day. Wake up. There she is. <laughs> She's awake during the day uh, and she sleeps at night and she likes to spend most of her day basking. Um, after she eats, especially, she, she eats large meals, right? She wants to eat a lot and then she'll sit and she'll rest for a bit. So I don't always feed her every day. She is an omnivore. She likes to eat fruits. Um, sometimes vegetables, not so much, and she loves meat. So she's going to eat mice and crickets, but they're kind of small. She'll eat pretty much anything that is that is uh, moving that she can catch and, and eat. She'll also scavenge. So she's kind of like a little cat. If I'm cleaning in here and she's out, she will actually get into my garbage bag because she just likes to scavenge in there and she likes to nose around and see things. Um, so she is, she's actually very much like a little cat. She has a, a big personality for a lizard. She's very highly evolved. She knows people. She can tell the difference between people. She knows me really well. She knows my son really well. And if somebody else comes into the animal room, she's not quite sure about what's going on. These guys, I don't have favorites, but boy, do I ever love these lizards. They are so super cool. As you can see, she has really, really big feet, um, really long nails. Those are great for digging in the dirt, great for digging apart uh, carcasses and stuff because she will eat animals that, uh, that are dead. She will eat carrion occasionally. Um, you'll see that she has pretty big jowls right here. She'll store some fat in there. Um, okay, I'm gonna take her out of her blanket and show you the rest of her body. Hopefully she will cooperate. She likes her blanket though, for some reason. There she is. Oh, no, she says, nope. We'll tuck her right here. So she is going to snuggle under my hair because it's nice and warm there too. I'm going to show you her whole body like this. There she is. And she's not exactly a huge tegu. So females are usually smaller than the male. So she's not as, as uh, big as some of the other ones are, but she's, she's pretty big. Now right now she is shedding her skin. Oh, it's over on this side. I'll, I'll switch around in a minute. And when she sheds her skin, it comes off usually in pieces, but sometimes the whole back piece will come off all at once and she leaves them laying around. And it's actually, it comes off in the pattern that you see on her. It comes off with the black and white pattern. I'll spin her around. She's doing really well. I'm so proud of her. Oh, I'm going to turn around there, girl. There we go. So you can see right here, she has some loose skin on her. I don't want to pick that off just in case it's not ready to come off, but eventually she'll lose that in the room. So she'll just scratch on some stuff or in her, in her tote, um, in her hide. She has a, a nice humid hide that she likes to sleep in um, and she'll scratch all that off, but there's a little bit coming off. I'll just, oh no, it's pretty stuck on there pretty good. But she is, I'm really, really proud of her. She is doing such a good job. She normally doesn't like to be held for this long. We've been working on it for quite a few years. She doesn't like to travel. That's why she's never been to Riverwood before, but hopefully soon um, we'll make the trip there and she'll, I'm sure we'll have some fun. You can also see her tail is quite thick right here. She stores fat there as well. So you know that she's getting some pretty good food because she's got some a good thick tail and a big belly. She is beautiful, I think. 
I love her so much. <laughs> um, they also eat eggs too. So they they will na uh, they'll raid nests of, of turtles and birds, um, anything that they can find. They're they're really quite they they like to eat. That is their favorite thing to do, and they're always looking for food. And she'll actually, if she's really hungry, she'll come and sit on my feet. And that's how she tells me that she's hungry. Kind of like a cat, you know, if they come and rub your legs, she'll come and she'll sit on my feet and she'll just sit there waiting for me to feed her. <laughs> Do we have any questions about uh, uh, Agnes? Yes, we have lots of questions about her actually. Um, one question that comes up is, are they dangerous in the wild or have they ever bitten you? So she has never bitten me, but I certainly pay attention to her body language. So as soon as she starts to fidget a little bit too much, I'm going to put her down because I don't want her to be so scared that she feels she has to protect herself. So with any of these animals, you just, you have to be aware of, of their body language and know them. And she does have some pretty good teeth and she does have a pretty big bite. So out in the wild, I would not mess with the tegu at all. <laughs> they, they certainly can have quite a bite and quite, um, you know, really sharp teeth for sure. So you just, you have to be respectful of them and, and uh, try and pay attention to their body language. And if they look like they're not happy, then you, you just stand back and say, that's okay. We don't need to bug you. <laughs> and we have some guessing questions. So is she a kind of snake or sorry, I should say he, is he a type of snake or Komodo dragon? Well, uh, she is a she actually. But that's oh, a good sorry. <laughs> he is a lizard. A lizard. Awesome. Just a big old monitor lizard. She's part of the monitor lizard family. Wonderful. They're, they're um, you know, some pretty big lizards, and they're they're quite uh, quite intelligent too. So she she's a bit of a problem solver. She likes to, um, you know, if there's sometimes I give her um, toys like for a small dog, you know, that that have you put, put the treats inside, and they have to search them out, and she'll work at it and try and get her treats, which are usually big um, hornworms. She loves those. I am going to put her down because I can feel her starting to wiggle a little bit. So she's going to go down. We have lots of questions actually coming in for you, Jennifer. Um, one of them coming from Facebook. Are the males and the females the same colors? Um, yeah, the black and white tegus are usually black and white. So some, they, they all look different though. They all have different patterns. So some of them might have more white. Some of them might have fewer spots. She has a good... <laughs> She's, she's carrying away, I have a stool and she's dragging it with her. She, <laughs> he's a character. Um, so she has a fair amount of black on her back. Some of them have a bit more white. Um, they all look a little bit different. You can tell them part because of their, you know, their markings on their face and their body. But um, as a rule, the black and white tegus are, are black and white. Awesome. And can she climb trees? Uh, she can, she's a bit heavy, right? She's, wow. she's kind of a chunky girl. Yeah. Um, they're, they're not really so um, agile that they're gonna climb a lot of trees, but they can climb trees. They're mostly terrestrial though. They mostly live on the ground. Yeah, and I think we can actually hear her carrying away a stool in the background maybe. <laughs> she has a spot that, that she basks on. Okay. So her basking light is there and her UV light is there because she needs uh, the UV because she's not getting the sunlight from outside. So she, right now she's got back to her basking spot and she's she's looking quite upset with me that <laughs> but I dragged her away from there, but she was really good. I was so proud of her. She's such I a good- she did very well, yeah. <laughs> um, and Jennifer, I guess this is just a, a question for you is how did you come by all these creatures? Are all of them your pets? Oh, they're all my pets. They're all part of my family. Um, some of them I got from people who can't take care of them anymore. Some of them I got from, from reputable breeders. Um, I do have friends that, that breed exotic critters as well. Um, and the, the, you know, we're, I'm not going out to the wild and grabbing animals because number one, these guys don't live in Ontario. And I really try hard to buy animals that are captive bred. So they're not coming from the wild. Um, they're coming from somebody who, who breeds them. So it's better for the animals that way. And of course, we don't want to take animals from the wild. They, they belong out there. So these guys, um, some of them, I don't really know their history because like I said, I've, I've gotten a few from the Humane Society, a few from people who just uh, surrendered them to me because they couldn't take care of them anymore. So I don't have all their histories, but for the most part, I really try very hard to get um, captive bred animals. Awesome. Um, I guess we'll do a couple more questions on her. Uh, actually, somebody missed the beginning of this program, and they're asking, where in the world is this from, and what is your organization, Jennifer? 
<laughs> so party, you mean where's party safari yeah. from? Yep. So I'm in the Shelburne area. I'm, I'm north of, of Mississauga. Um, and I'm, it's me. It's me and my family. And uh, I just, I have a huge passion for animals. And I really, really, really like to talk about them and show them off and go, look at, they're so cool. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and hopefully share my enthusiasm and love for them. So I, I, I like to educate uh, everybody about the different critters and, and uh, you know, the amazing things that nature has to offer. And um, does she have any siblings? Uh, no, she doesn't. She probably would not get along with them very well. They're not, um, they don't really hang out in big groups. They will be together out in the wild, but as a rule, they, they tend to stay uh, separate. So she she is a, she's an only tegu. She is the only tegu that I have, um, and she likes it that way because she gets spoiled <laughs> a little bit more. <laughs> I'm just going to grab the next one so that we're That's ready. Wonderful. Thank you for answering all those questions, Jennifer. No problem. We're ready for another one. We are. Yes. Okay. The next one is an amphibian. So when he was born, he started off as a, a bunch of eggs that were laid in the water. And those eggs um, hatched into little tadpoles. Those tadpoles started to grow legs um, and lungs and lose their gills. And eventually they come out of the land and they turn into something as amazing as Frodo. He is squishing down. He's a little hard to hold on to because he's pretty round. There, <laughs> there he is. <laughs> this is Frodo. And Frodo is a Pac-Man frog. They're called Pac-Man frogs because they're basically big round mouths with stomachs. He loves to eat and that's what his favorite thing is to do. He eats and then he eats and he eats some more and then he sleeps because he's exhausted from all that eating. I'm gonna try and turn him a little bit so we can see, oh, no, he doesn't want, he look, wants to look at the camera. His legs are really not that long. They're kind of small and short. Uh, he doesn't do a lot of hopping around. He doesn't do a lot of moving. He likes to sit pretty still. He's an ambush predator. So if we look at his eyes, move him a little bit. <laughs> He's so cute. <laughs> his eyes are on the top of his head and he, they're, they're pretty um, high up on his head. And what he does is he likes to bury himself in the, in the moss and the, in the grasses and stuff in the swamplands down where he comes from in South America. And he'll just wait there until food comes by. And then he jumps out and grabs it because he likes to eat meat, he's a carnivore. And he grabs that food and he shoves it in his mouth and he swallows it down. So he's gonna eat anything that is alive that he can shove in his mouth and swallow down. He's gonna eat mice, lizards, spiders, frogs, toads, birds, anything, snakes, anything that he can shove in his mouth and swallow down. If I was this big, he'd probably eat me too. But for now, he'll just accept that I bring him food. Oh, he's so cute. Um, and, and basically, he just, he just eats. He likes to eat. He does have to be near water. His skin has to stay nice and moist. Um, if it dries out too much, then he'll certainly not be feeling very good. And he can breathe through his skin. So his skin needs to stay moist for that. So I always have to make sure I have nice, clean hands, but not clean with soap or sanitizer. I have to clean with some fresh water ahead of time to touch him because his skin is so sensitive. <laughs> he just, he's so, he's just like, yeah, I'm just going to hang out here. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to bring this meeting to order. <laughs> oh, I can't stand it. He's so cute. Um... So he's gonna live probably 10 years maybe if I feed him really well. There is a tendency for him to get really big and chubby, but I have to watch what he eats because it's not good for everything to get really chubby. Uh, I have to remember that in the wild, they're not gonna have an unlimited supply of food. They do have to search for their food and they have to um, you know, go through sometimes that there's not as much food. So I tend to make sure that I kind of follow along with that and don't give him everything that he would like because otherwise he would get really, really big. Do we have any questions for him? Yes, we do. And what a cutie. Oh my goodness. So cute. <laughs> he's, too much. He's, just, he's too much. Um, so there was kind of more questions about what they eat. Do they eat flies? Um, and would a frog eat another smaller frog? Oh yes, if I had another frog, if he was in the same enclosure as another frog that was smaller than him, he would eat that frog. Really? Yeah, so he's by himself, he doesn't have any friends. Um, flies, you know, if it comes close enough to him, he's going to eat it, but he's not going to work too hard to, ch <laughs> to chase him down. Um, he prefers something else, like he'll eat 
you know, sometimes he'll eat mice. So the bigger the food item, the better, he thinks, like, just as long as he can get it in his mouth and swallow down. So flies are okay, but they are a lot of work to try and, and catch. So he would prefer if something bigger came along. But he'll eat, um, you know, his other frogs if, if there's, um, you know, a group of them that, that hatched out and one grows bigger than the others, then he'll eat the other ones. I'm just going to put him back in his container because he is wiggly. Getting a little fussy there. <laughs> yeah, these containers that I have them into, they're not their normal enclosures. These are just their, I get them crowded in their little containers just so that they're easy Ready to, go. to bring out. That's awesome. Um, somebody asked, is Frodo a social animal? And I think you kind of answered this, but I guess um, in the wild too, like how do they socialize with other frogs of the same so species? Certain times of the year they would. So usually in the in the spring time, like wherever they're from, there would be a mating season and that's when they would all come together and there would probably be large groups of them then. Right. But otherwise okay. they're going to find their own spot. And I'm sure in one area you're going to find a bunch of them, but they're not kind of all hanging out. But they would, if they're the similar size, they, they wouldn't mind because then there's no threat that somebody's going to eat them. And somebody in the chat, Lisa, has asked, how big can they get? Oh, That's already a big frog you're holding there, Jennifer. How much bigger can they get? <laughs> as big around as my as the palm of my hand. Wow. They can't get it. So he's not full grown yet. He's still got another year or so maybe of growing. Um, and then he'll be his full size. So some of them are smaller, some of them are much bigger, you know, just like people. We're not all the same height, not all the same build, but um, He's, he's a pretty, he's a pretty chunky frog. He's done a lot of growing since I got him. And I guess we'll do one more question. What activities does Frodo like to do? Are there any activities that Frodo does do or does Frodo just sit there most of the time? Frodo pretty much just sits there. He <laughs> likes to sit in his water, then he might jump out of the water and sit in his moss mm. and he might go back in the water again. And basically he just, he just likes to kind of sit there. He might hop around a little bit, but he's not very active at all. He just is waiting for food to come to him. So basically lunch, dinner, breakfast, those are all his favorite. And he's then- like a busy day. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't get lunch, breakfast, and dinner though. He's, he wants it, but he only gets usually one meal. <laughs> he's, awesome. he's most active at night. So he's going to become more active at night. So some, you know, in the middle of the night, maybe he's hopping around more than I, I realized because I'm in bed by then, but he's, he's, you know, not so, so active. He pretty much just sits still most of the time. Awesome. And we are getting some more questions. So I'm going to take two more and then um, we can move on. Um, Michaela has asked, how do frogs shed? Do they shed? They do shed. Yeah. So he sits in his water and when he's ready to shed, it kind of comes off in like a, um, I'm trying to think. It's kind of slimy, but his skin does all come off. It's kind of like, because it's wet usually, right? And it comes off and he, he needs that slime in order to, to get it off. And it's, it's um, a pretty cool thing. Um, then usually by the time I find it, it's dried up in his enclosure, but uh, it's, it, Sometimes it's usually all in one piece. The odd time he might have some still on his feet and I don't usually see him shed his skin. Nice. It's usually, he's, he's fine one day and then the next he's, he's looking a little brighter. His colors are brighter. Um, and you can see on his, his coloring, I know that it, we didn't really see his back very well because he was not interested in showing it. I'll see if I can show you on the thing. But his colors are, are pretty much, oh, you can't really see. It's camouflage colored. So he's, he's, um, Right now, his colors are pretty bright because he did shed not long ago. And, and as he's going to shed again, he gets a little bit darker, a little bit duller. And then I know he's going to shed sometime soon. And then the next thing you know, he's looking really bright and shiny. Comes off just kind of like a glove. Kind of, yeah. Like, wet glove. <laughs> wet, wet glove, yeah. And he hops, that's when he does come out of the water and he hops around a bit and it gets stuck in the moss and just kind of all comes off. Very interesting. And the last question we'll do about Frodo is where are these frogs located? Like down where do they naturally occur? Down in South America. Nice. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Wonderful. All right. I think we'll see. I have someone who's been scratching the whole time. I don't know if you could hear. <laughs> she is impatient. She says it's my turn. I have to make sure. Oh yeah, this is the right one. Uh, she is a reptile as well. So um, she came, she was, she hatched out of an egg. Same with the bird. She hatched out of an egg. Same with the tegu. Uh, she hatched out of an egg too. Um, this one hatched out of an egg. 
that was left in the dirt in the wild. That's where they would lay them. And when these guys come out of the egg, they're on their own. Their moms and dads don't take care of them. They hatch. They're teeny tiny. They look just like their moms and dads, only small. And they have to go off and find their own food. Now, this one is one of the cutest of these, I'd say, in the world. Um, but maybe that's just because she's one of my favorites. This is Matilda. And she is a box turtle. She's actually an ornate box turtle, and she's called that because of the markings on her shell. She comes from down in the States. There's not so, so many of these guys in the wild anymore, and that's because they're losing their habitat. They're losing the places that they live, um, which is kind of sad. So it's important that if we have these guys in captivity that we do uh, make sure that none of them come from the wild because they are quite threatened down there. Now, she was born in captivity, and that's why I have her. Um, and she's a lot of work to take care of. She can live up to 40 years, which is a really long time. Now, she is not an aquatic turtle like those guys at Riverwood. She is a land turtle. She lives on the land. If we look at her feet, they are not webbed. She has big, long nails for digging in the dirt. And she likes to burrow under, under logs in the dirt. She'll maybe take some gopher holes in the wild. They would live in them. Um, in their, her enclosure here, she has really deep substrate, which is the, the bedding that she lives in, which is dirt. Um, and I sometimes plant some grass seeds in there for her to roam around in. Um, and she likes to bury herself down underneath. Um, and like I said, she, she can live for about 40 years, for between 30 and 40 years. Now, she's not quite as much work as the aquatic turtles because I don't have to change a big tank of water, but she certainly does need fresh water all the time. And as soon as she does have fresh water, she likes to sit in it and she likes to have a bath and get dirty. Um, she is an omnivore and she likes to eat um, some plants, some vegetables, uh, some fruits, but mostly she likes to eat meat and she'll actually eat mice. Uh, crickets, worms, she likes big dew worms, she likes horn worms, uh, but she really, really, really likes mice. And when I feed her mice, I feed her mice that are that are pre-killed, they're already um, dead, and I put them in there and she likes to eat them. So in the wild they will eat carrion, so they'll eat dead animals, which is really important, right, because we need animals that eat up those those critters that, that pass away in the wild. So she does a really good job of cleaning those up and she just eats it all, bones, everything, munches away. Um, I've had her for quite a while and she's grown, she about doubled in size, but she is full grown. This is as big as she's going to get. She is a mature female. She is, I think, oh, I'll have to think this is a good question. She's probably about 12 years old. Um, so she is as big as she's going to get. And I think she's pretty amazing. Now, if we look at her beak, she has a beak in the front there. Um, I have to make sure that I keep giving her really good foods for her to eat and foods that are not too soft because she needs to grind that beak down. She needs to keep eating something. So when her beak starts to get a little bit longer, like I noticed, maybe it could be give her some tougher foods now, right? Because she's got to grind that down a little bit. Um, so it's my job to make sure that I keep checking on those things and making sure she gets everything that she needs for sure. Now she's called a box turtle because her shell is like a box. When she gets scared, she will go inside her shell. So most of the turtles that we have here in Ontario, they just kind of tuck, right? They tuck. She can pull herself all the way inside her shell and she can actually close her shell up tight. So if I were to tickle her, no, she's not going to go in. She's not really that scared. She'll go in a little bit, but she's not going to close it up tight, but she'll actually shut her shell up tight. And um, they do that for their protection. So there's a lot of animals that cannot uh, get to her when she's inside her shell because the shell is really, really hard. It does a really good job of protecting her. So she goes inside that shell, she shuts it up tight, and it protects her from the majority of predators. Now her main predator in the wild down in the States would be birds of prey, like hawks and eagles. And what they do is they fly above and they swoop down and pick them up. See, she's not very happy. And uh, they would take them high in the air and, and drop them so their shell cracks. And if she didn't have her shell, she would not be alive, right? Her shell is very important. She cannot come out of her shell. It is part of her body. And she needs that shell in order to keep on living. So um, if her shell does crack, sometimes we can do repairs on shells on, on turtles that get that get injured on the road. Um, but they really they need that shell for protection. Now, some people think that their shell is kind of like a helmet that you can knock on it, but she can actually feel even the most gentle little touch. Oh, see that? That tickled her a little bit. So she said, oh, she can feel the most gentle little touch on her shell. 
she's pretty, pretty amazing. She's, so I don't know if I'm too impressed today. <laughs> <laughs> a little grumpy. <laughs> you know, she's a turtle and she's cute. So she's allowed to be. Yeah, no, totally true. Um, are you ready for some questions about her, Jennifer? Yes, please. Um, is she slow or fast? We're getting that question quite a lot. That People want to know. <laughs> I'm faster than she is but she's pretty fast for a turtle. Like most people think they're kind of slow. And usually when I put her down, she kind of has like a bit of a turbo boost and she runs forward a little bit and then she goes along a little bit. They can, they can move fairly fast. Not as fast as a bunny can hop, uh, not as fast as a cat can run, but faster than you would think for sure. Awesome. And I like this question. Somebody asked, do they use the washroom a lot? <laughs> So she likes to use her water dish sometimes at the washroom and they do, it's, you know, depending on how much they eat, but they do eat a fair bit and, and, you know, they're not the, they're not the sweetest smelling animals when they use the washroom. They, they are quite stinky, um, which is part of the, you know, part of what's difficult to take care of them. So um, I sometimes ask, you know, if, if, because she's a lot to take care of, she's, she's picky about food. Sometimes I have to get those mice for her that she really likes. Um, I always have to change their water because she's always in there bathing and getting it dirty. Um, and so I'll, I'll often ask, you know, if, if, if I get tired of taking care of her, should I just go put her outside? Which no, of course we shouldn't, right? Because she is a pet. She's been in my house and she is not a wild critter and she does not belong in Ontario. She comes from down in the States. So turtles that are pets do not belong out in the wild at all. Even if it is a lot of work for me to take care of her, I've made that commitment. I'm going to make sure that I keep taking care of her for sure. And that goes the same for our little pet turtles at Riverwood. We have five red-eared sliders and they are all pets forever. <laughs> um, we have another question. Do they hibernate? I guess in the wild, do they hibernate? So they, they do, they go, through a, a, they go through a cool time where they bury themselves down underneath the the ground and they'll have a really slow time and then once it starts to get warmer again they'll come out. And I guess um, what is the closest turtle to her uh, in Ontario? Um, well we do have a similar species I guess. We do have uh, the wood turtle right? I think that would be fairly similar. The closest species yeah probably. How about the eastern box turtle? Eastern yeah yeah, there's an eastern box turtle in Ontario, but they're very hard to find too because of uh, collecting and habitat loss. And what happens to their shell as they grow? Because they're all attached to their shell, what happens to it? So that's a good question. They actually shed pieces of their shell off and they grow and so it continues to grow. If we look, I don't know if we can see, see over here, you can see those little ridges on there. Those are her growth plates. So as she grows, it starts to spread out and she just keeps growing more and more ridges, kind of like more and more layers almost, but it starts, just keeps growing. Now she is full size, like I said, she's she is full size, so she's not gonna keep growing, but she does have to keep her shell healthy. So she will lose pieces of her shell off. You can see up on the front here, starting to get a little bit, she will lose some pieces. So it's not like a, it's not like the lizard that loses it all at once. She starts to lose little pieces as she goes. And she'll also lose the skin on her neck, her turtleneck. Um, she'll shed that skin off too. Um, okay, we'll do one more question. Um, Salvador, who is age six, wants to ask, are there any poisonous reptiles or amphibians along the river um, in Mississauga? It's a big question for age six. I would say so. I don't think in Mississauga, right? We don't have anything that is venomous down there. I don't believe so, but we do have one venomous snake that is in, where, whereabouts would that be found, Jennifer? It's on more, more north of here. So north, north of Mississauga, sure, and even north of me, and I'm, I'm a fair bit uh, north of Mississauga. So that would be uh, the Massasauga. And I so badly want to see them out in the wild, but I have not seen one yet, because that would be very, very cool. Yeah, so we don't have to worry down in, in our area about, about those snakes for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much. No problem. I'm going to put her in her tank because it's right beside me. And next we're going to meet a furry little thing. Not a mammal though. This one is furry in a different way. Maybe not a way that everybody loves, but I love her very, very much. Her name is Rosita and she is a tarantula. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move very, very slowly to get her out so I don't scare her because she's kind of small compared to me. Here she comes. Oh, she's backing up. There we go. There she is. This is Rosita. And she is a Chilean rose hair tarantula. She comes from Chile down in South America. So we don't have spiders quite this amazing here. In, well, they're all amazing. All spiders are amazing, but not quite um, the same as this pretty girl here. Now she's called a rose hair because of the pink hairs on her head. She has some pink hairs. It's kind of hard to see. Sorry about the lighting. Um, and pink, uh, rose is another name for pink. So it's just talking about the color of her of her hairs. Um, now she is a terrestrial species. She lives on the ground. She doesn't live high up in the trees or high up um, in the room, you know, in her enclosure. She stays on the ground for the most part. She can climb up, but for the most part, she stays down. Um, and she likes to live underneath logs and leaves and stuff. Um, and she hides there and she's a bit of an ambush predator as well. So what she does when she lays, when she has her web, she lays it on the ground and she makes a carpet on the ground. And what happens is when the little creatures like the little crickets and stuff come creeping by, she can feel that on her web and she'll run out and she'll grab it. Now she is venomous, which sounds really, really scary, but her venom is not that potent. If she were to bite me, it'd be kind of like a bee sting and I, I'd be okay. Um, now that being said, I do not have an allergy to her venom, so I'm okay. And some people do have a ven uh, an allergy to bee stings. So that's why bees are not a problem for me, but they are for other people. So if we do see a tarantula out in the wild, of course, we would just leave it be and let it alone because you never really know how you're going to uh, react to it. But her main way of protecting herself is by kicking off her hair. So if you notice on her back end here, she has some hairs and they're called urticating hairs. So when she gets really, really upset, what she does is she uses her back legs and she kicks those hairs off and the hairs go floating in the air, kind of like little bits of burr. And they're barbed like burrs. You know, when you're walking through the woods and you get burrs stuck to you, um, that's because they have those, the, the burrs have little barbed edges on them. And that's the same as her hair. So it could get stuck if a predator was trying to eat her and she kicked those hairs, it could get stuck in their eyes or their nose and it'd be super, super itchy. Now we can't see how many eyes she has, but her eyes are just right there behind that white line, that lighter colored line. And she has eight eyes. She has eight legs. Looks like she has 10, but these two things here in the front, those are called her pedipalps, kind of like feelers. And in the back here, she has, we can't really see them very well, but two things that are called spinnerets, and that's where the web comes from. So sometimes when she's on my hand, she likes to put web on me. So her spinnerets will move like this, and she'll attach web to me, and my hand will be all covered in web, which is really kind of cool. I like it. Now, like I said, she likes to eat insects mostly. She will eat smaller, tiny little um, lizards maybe, or mammals if she can, but in, in my room, she just eats crickets. And what happens is when I put those crickets in, she doesn't have teeth for eating like we do. She doesn't have teeth uh, for biting pieces off. She doesn't have teeth for grinding pieces. What she does instead is she um, runs out, she grabs those crickets with her petty pelps and she bites with her fangs and she injects the venom into the cricket. And that turns the inside of the cricket kind of into a smoothie. And then she <laughs> slurps it up. Delicious. Definitely yummy. <laughs> wow, cricket smoothies for lunch, everyone. Oh yeah. Um, are you ready for some questions, Jennifer? Yes, please. Okay. So there's a lot of comments about venomous versus poisonous. Um, so I'm wondering if you can clarify the difference between the two. The poison, when, when somebody's talking about poison, they're usually talking about something that you eat, you ingest, and it makes you sick. Uh, venomous is something that is, is bitten or stung, it's injected into you, and, that's, and it causes you to be, uh, become you know, sick or causes a reaction. So she, I could eat her and, and not have a problem, but if she were to bite, that's when the venom would come in. So there's some frogs that, that are, are poisonous, but if you get them on your skin and it goes into your mouth, that it would cause some problems. Um, but she's, so she's venomous. I hope that cleared it up. <laughs> yeah, no, it did for sure. <laughs> um, a lot of people are fearful of spiders. How did you get over your fear of spiders, Jennifer? Ever was scared of spiders. I was maybe not so sure, but edu but educating myself about them and getting to know them really really calmed me down. Like I, this this tarantula is is um, uh, I love her so much. Like I love her so so much. The same that some people love their dog or their cat. 
I love my tarantula that much. She is, <laughs> she is that, I can't cuddle her. She doesn't like to snuggle. Um, but I mean, I really, I love her that much. And I love, I love the way, you know, sometimes the feet, the way that they move scares people, but I love that. I love the feel of her. I like the, the two tiny little claws on the end of each foot and how they hang on. I love everything about her. And I like that she eats bugs. That's really cool. If we didn't have spiders, we'd have so, so many bugs to worry about. Very true. Um, do tarantulas eat other tarantulas in the wild? They can. Yeah, for sure. It's maybe not their first, their first uh, food item, but they do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Jennifer, do you have other arachnids such as scorpions? I do. I have scorpions. I actually have 12, oh, sorry, 10 baby scorpions. Um, and, and another bigger one and the baby scorpions I've had since they were on their mummy's back. So I, I had the mom and, and, uh, she had the babies and I have 10 of them here. I have two of them went to other homes, but I still have 10 and they're all named. This is scorpion number one. And this is scorpion, <laughs> number, two, scorpion number three. <laughs> and I call them all sting. <laughs> Can you remember all their names or no? <laughs> yeah. Sting number one and sting number two. <laughs> All their enclosures are, are, are numbered. They so. both? Oh, awesome. All right, I'm just going to tuck her back in again. Sometimes yeah. it takes a little bit because you have to be very gentle. I just don't want to scare her. So she has an exoskeleton. Her skeleton is on the outside of her body. And it's really, because she's a terrestrial species, it's really not all that tough. So if she were to fall from a high distance, her exoskeleton could actually crack and then she would not be feeling so great. So I always make sure I move really slow and don't scare her so she doesn't want to skitter off my hand. There, she is safe and sound. All right, the next we have a mammal. I think we're, we're good for questions. We're all right? Yep, we are good to go. All you right, the next one. Background too. <laughs> that's, that's Bruce the quail. He's calling. He likes to jump in every now and then, eh? You know, he's got he's to do some talking too, right? <laughs> so this next one is a mammal. She comes from Africa. Um, mammals have hair or fur. Uh, this one has a couple extra little cool things too. Let me just get her out. She's a bit tricky to pick up sometimes. She has some quills. This is a nettle. <laughs> She's so cute. And Nettle is an African pygmy hedgehog. So you see these on her back. Those are her quills. So right now they're a little bit prickly, not as prickly as, as if she were feeling really scared. But what she does to protect herself is she curls up into this spiky ball. And she sticks those quills out so that anything that went to eat her, went to bite her, would get a mouthful of quills. Now her quills don't come out like a porcupine's do. Her quills stay in. Um, and they're just quite prickly. <laughs> she's so cute. She's very, very snippy. She is nocturnal. She's supposed to be sleeping right now. So she's a, a, awake at night and she sleeps during the day. Um, but I woke her, oh, look at her teeth. Can you see her teeth in there? Oh, she's got some good teeth. Um, so I woke her up and now she's all really quite curious about what's going on. She doesn't really know what, what the deal is. Um, maybe there's food. She's thinking maybe, maybe she'll get some food early today. I usually feed her when I, before I go to bed at night. Um, now you saw those little teeth and those are good teeth for chewing on some insects. Now she is mostly an insectivore in the wild. They're going to eat the bugs and the slugs and the grubs that are in, they find in the, in the grasslands or in gardens near farmers. So farmers really like them. Gardeners really like hedgehogs because they eat all the yucky bugs and they love the farmers because the farmers usually have a lot of bugs around because they're trying to eat the crops and the, the plants. So she loves to eat. Uh, it's one of her favorite things. And she also loves to run. She will run and run and run all night long on her wheel. So I have to make sure she always has a wheel in her, in her uh, cage that is running, or running really smoothly so she can run and run. And she'll run like three kilometers every night. She runs and runs and runs and runs and runs. So she has small little legs, but boy, can she ever run. She's not super duper fast, but she's, she's got stamina. She's an endurance runner. <laughs> she's very cute now these guys their lifespan is about three to five years they don't live very long um but that's okay because they're they're pretty amazing when they when they have their babies they have naked little babies and eventually their quills come out um and then they end up like this so she is a full grown she's as big as she's gonna get but when she was smaller she had her baby quills and then she had to lose her baby kind of like our baby teeth uh, she had to lose her baby quills and she then grew in all her big grown-up quills. So she has all these quills. She might 
lose a couple and grow a few of them, you know, like we, we lose hair. Um, but as a rule, they keep most of their quills for their entire life. <laughs> she's just so, she's very, very active for being, you know, the middle of the day for her. So because I can't give her the food that she would eat in the wild, as many insects and stuff that she would get, she needs a higher protein food. Um, so what I feed her is a really super high quality cat food. And that's what she likes to eat. And it gives her a good crunch and it's good for her little teeth. Um, so that's what she eats. And I also give her live insects. So I have mealworms and crickets and superworms. And sometimes she might eat some wax worms every now and then. Now you can see, <laughs> she really doesn't want to be a ball right now, but you can see she has extra skin here and she can curl that up into, oh, there she goes. She's curling up into her ball and she can even pull them over her face. She's not so scared that she's going to hide her entire head, but when she is really super scared, you can't see her face at all. She just looks like a big giant prickly cactus. <laughs> I can't stop looking at her. She's so cute. All of them are so cute. <laughs> yeah, in their own way, right? It's trickier to keep uh, entertained, so I may have to put her away a little bit sooner, but... Um, Jennifer, are they related to possums or rats or mice? Somebody has asked in the chat. You know, my, my mind just went blank for a second. Can we just get back to that question in a second? I'm Absolutely. Gonna, a lot of people think that they're mostly, they're closely related to the porcupine, but they're not. It okay. is most, yeah, I'll, I'll get, let me think for a second and I'll, no I'll get. No worries. Yeah. It's a good question because she does, um, look quite similar to all of those creatures in some sort of way, right? She does, yeah. Um, somebody has also asked, is it expensive to feed all of your creatures? It is very expensive to feed all of them because they all eat different things, right? I, I buy a lot of insects, um, which sounds like, you know, that I could go outside and get them, but I, I get them from insect breeders because then I know that they've been fed well and that they've, um, they have, they've been fed a good diet and that they don't have any pesticides on the, or insecticides on them or pesticides from out in the, the grasses and stuff. So I know that they're nice and clean and they're healthy for my animals and they've been fed a good diet. Um, then there's fruits and vegetables and there's the rodents and all the different animals eat different size rodents. So it, you know, it, it certainly adds up for sure. <laughs> and what's some way that all the viewers today can support um, feeding these animals and all these creatures that you have? Well, I, I'm offering the, the virtual safaris, the safari online for groups, which are great for birthday parties, just having a, a get together with friends, um, joining up by computer. So if you can't get together with your friends in person, you can all log on and uh, do it that way. And it's just, it's super fun to see them and support a smaller business that's, that's uh, looking to feed the critters. That's awesome. And I see Catherine. Catherine did some research. Catherine, do you want to talk about what you found out? Well, it's such a good question because animals with that long snout and those small little teeth at the front, they could be rodents. You could think of a mouse or a vole uh, or maybe a, a rabbit. But in fact, hedgehogs seem to be different relative, distant relatives of a shrew which can be found. There's a sh shrew species in Ontario, and I commented in the chat that they're one of the few mammals that actually has venom. Mm -hmm. So that's your neat fact of the day. Hedgehogs and shrews, pals in evolution. <laughs> I, was, I was like, it's not an opossum, it's something, and I was, I was grasping at it, and the information wasn't coming into my brain. <laughs> Um, and then a couple more questions coming up about your little friend there. Do you ever need a veterinarian? Yes, I do, for sure. So, and it's a little bit more difficult when you have animals like I do, because not all vets understand uh, how to properly care for them. So there's, in my area, um, there's two vets that live that are somewhat close. It's about an hour each way, uh, north and south, and that's where I would go if I have an issue. And you have to make sure um, if you're, again, if you're considering animals like this, that there is a vet that's close by because um, it is important if, if they're not feeling well, you have to take care of them. And it's a bit trickier. You also have to do a lot of, I have to keep on top of, of checking my animals out and making sure they're okay. The reptiles, um, part of the way that they defend themselves is not showing illness. If they don't show that they're that they're hurt or that they're not feeling well, then it keeps them a little bit safer from predators. Uh, but the problem is that by the time I notice 
it's it's they're they're often feeling worse than you think that they are because they they hide that so i have to keep really close tabs on how they're all doing um like this little guy behind me look he's looking that's willard if all of a sudden one day he refuses a worm then i know uh oh something's not quite right so I keep track and if he eats the next day, that's fine, but I'll, I'll always make sure that I keep close track of how much they're eating, what they're eating. Um, and as soon as something seems a little bit off, then I, I make sure that I, I take them into a vet if I have to. Wonderful. And Jennifer, I'm looking at the time right now. It is almost 3.30. This hour has just flew by. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about or show us before we end off? Cause I don't want to keep you too much longer. <laughs> I just want to say you one more. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. One more, one more, and it's kind of worth the wait. We always love more. <laughs> There's just so many questions coming in. Usually at the end, you know, it's a, not that all of them haven't been really cool, but these ones are particularly cool. It's just the lid, it's okay. <laughs> there she is. Wow. There's Daisy. Daisy is a ball python. She comes from Africa, so the same kind of area that the hedgehog came from. Uh, these guys are, are constrictor snakes. They don't have venom. None of my snakes have venom. Um, she is oh, a constrictor, so what she does is she squeezes her prey. She's gonna eat rats mostly. In the wild, she would eat some gerbils, maybe some African softer rats, but in the animal room, she eats just um, rats, like normal rats. Um, I feed pre-kills, I don't feed her live, and she does a really good job of eating, if you can see her body. She's a thick snake, and that's the way that they're supposed to be. They are shorter pythons or not. She, I mean, she's big enough for sure, but she's not a huge python by any means. Um, and she's, oh, um, she's perfect, I think. She looks amazing. If you look at her markings, she kind of looks like rocks, like if she were on the ground, she would blend in. So that tells me that she spends a lot of time in the wild on the ground. And we're going to take a look at her face. Now she doesn't see so well. So sometimes when I move my hand a little too fast towards her head, she gets a little bit nervous. She pulls her head back. Now, if you see those holes above her mouth, let's see if I can get her in front here. She has holes above her mouth and those are called heat pits. So she senses heat with those. And that's what she um, will use to hunt her warm blooded prey. So mammals, um, smaller mammals like rats, she can sense that heat and that's how she hunts mostly because her eyesight is not very good. Now her sense of smell is pretty cool. If we see her tongue coming out, she is smelling the air with her tongue. That's how she smells. So as she's sticking her tongue out, she's grabbing the scent particles in the air. She's pulling those scent particles inside her mouth and on the roof of her mouth is an organ called the Jacobson's organ. And that's what identifies the smell. So right now she says, she probably smelled that hedgehog I was holding. She's thinking, oh, oh, that smells okay, but it's not feeding day to day. Now she only eats once a week or once every two weeks. Uh, because she is an adult, she's as big as she's gonna get. Um, and she's a thicker snake, so she doesn't need food, you know, a huge amount of food. So she'll eat one rat every seven to 14 days. And that's all she, all she needs to eat. And that's what keeps her healthy. Now in, those, in the winter time, when the months are a little bit cooler, she slows down on her eating and she can actually go four months without eating which sounds a little bit scary. And you know, it, it is a little bit trying for me because I, I like them to eat, but that's just what they do. They just slow down because they don't need as much, as much food because they're not very active. Now she is not um, a hugely active snake. They stay pretty much still. She does come out at night, um, but even still, unless she's hunting for food, she doesn't really move around all that much. She's kind of like a rock a little bit. Um, she does give great hugs. One of my favorite things to do is put her on my shoulders. And she's, oh, she just feels so great. It feels nice. The weight on my shoulders is amazing. And she just sits there and she likes to hang out. So sometimes when I'm doing work on a computer, I'll just put her on my shoulders and, and we hang out together. Now she likes the, the warmth of my body, especially under my hair, because it's nice and warm. She is cold blooded. Her body does not produce heat. So she needs to find a source of heat to warm herself up. And she loves underneath my hair. It's super warm under there. So that's why she, I, I like to think she loves me a lot, but I think she just likes my warmth. She thinks I'm, I'm, I'm pretty warm. <laughs> she is so beautiful. I love her. Is, and do you have other species of snakes that you have as pets too, Jennifer? I do. I have some corn snakes. I have a, um, a Kenyan sand boa. I have some very large constrictor snakes as well. Um, it's not this, this environment, this, this, um, venue is not so great for those big snakes just because it's hard to see them 
and it takes a while for them to settle in. But I do have some some pretty big ones, some small, big, medium size, a lot of different snakes. So I was going to say too, when she eats her food, she doesn't have teeth for chewing her food. She just has teeth for hanging on. So what she does is she grabs it and she's a constrictor snake. So when she grabs the, in the wild, if she were eating a live one, she would grab that rat, wrap her body around and she would squeeze until the rat isn't moving anymore. Then she finds the head of the rat and she swallows it down whole. So that's why she doesn't need so, <laughs> hello, <laughs> she doesn't need so much food because she swallows her food down whole. And you can see it go all the way down her, her, her head, expands and her neck gets really big and expands as she swallows it all the way down and it goes all the way down around here till right about here in her stomach and then you can see a lump for a day or two and then and then within four days you can't see a lump anymore and that's how she eats her food it's pretty amazing wow and i guess kind of related to that somebody has asked have they ever or will they ever squeeze people or you jennifer <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. So my bigger snakes, the bigger constrictors that I have, I do have to be careful when I take them out. We are um, not that they're going to they're trying to hurt me. I just have to be responsible. Same as if I if I'm around horses. Right. I have to know and be aware that that horses might not see me and might step on my feet or, you know, I have to be all animals. You have to be aware of. Um, and we have a neck that's kind of delicate and snakes don't really understand a neck when they constrict um, their prey. What they do is they squeeze the chest. Right? They don't go around the animal's neck usually, they go around the chest and they'll squeeze. But that being said, if she was, um, if one of the bigger snakes was not feeling like they were so secure and they wanted to hang on a little tighter and it was around my neck, um, I'd have to be super careful, right? I wouldn't want them around, wrapped around my neck at all. So I would make sure that um, if I do have my big snakes out, I usually make sure that I have someone with me at all time. Just just to be super duper safe but they don't want to eat me I am not food I don't smell good I don't smell like food and they can't swallow me down whole so I, I'm not worried now Daisy here um she's I'm stronger than she is for sure so she's not she's not at all a worry and my smaller smaller snakes are not a worry at all and I guess if we have time for just one more question and this is I think a common question among all of your pets today is she fast? <laughs> is she fast? Can oh, is she fast? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't. No worries. Um, you know she can slither pretty fast, but she, again, she's kind of like a rock. You know, she doesn't have to move too much. So that's that's the way it is. But she can slither pretty fast if she wants to, and she can climb a tree, and she can get up the tree pretty fast too. Um, I certainly want wouldn't want to put her out on the grass and not be you know be ready to to move pretty fast to catch her uh because she she can slither fast i can still run faster than she can but she's she's a quick girl she's faster than the turtle <laughs> well wonderful thank you so much jennifer for showing you all of our your beautiful and cute little critters today um there are so many questions and people that are really really excited about this so i'm going to post in the chat there are some party safari links and also the virtual safari online. Um, if you were interested in having Jennifer at one of your more personalized uh, programs and to see them and be able to talk to Jennifer one-on-one, -on -one, you can book that through there. Um, but I think that's all we have time for today. I wish we could stay here forever and talk to Jennifer and see all of her critters. <laughs> um, but I just wanna say thank you again. It has been wonderful and I learned so much. I was excited all week for this. <laughs> I had a great time too. I love talking about my critters. So, And hopefully we'll have you back on site soon when it is safe to do so, Jennifer. Um, I want to say thank you once again and thank you everyone for joining us and have a great and safe spring break. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you everyone.